Hey you all, welcome to Humans of Eurovision and today is dedicated to Sweden. You know, we all love this country, not just because of Eurovision and their music. We also love their fikas, you know, this awesome sweet and coffee style type of pause. We love their design. Probably all of us has something from their embassy in our house. And I must remind you of their literature. You know, literature, they're dark, thrillers, drama, murders, and we all, we all love it, probably. And, I'm sorry. Well, I must take it. Hey, hola. 50,000 to eat cherry. Well, okay. I think we love the Swedish Mafia, too. Hey Ola, tell me how you're doing. Under the circumstances, very well, thank you. Um, it's been a strange year so far, um, but um, I managed to keep my boat floating and um, being very busy with our new American venture. So uh, it's, um, which is extremely wonderful, but also it breaks my heart that most of my colleagues are. Um, sitting home doing absolutely nothing yeah but there's probably nothing what we we can do anything about it but you 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 didn't worry yourself you you weren't bored because like you 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 had like three maybe four projects ongoing this year of course the covid probably changed everything but you were the lucky one that you finished few of them like uh, melody festival in which you are working for how many years man well, Mel actually, Mel I didn't work with Melody Festival, and I after uh, Tel Aviv, uh, I went one hundred percent into the American Song Contest project. So, um, so that's what I've been working with, and since that is not scheduled to happen until late fall of twenty twenty one or early spring twenty twenty two, that project is you know we're we're still keeping full steam ahead. And then at some point, I guess we have to um, be flexible and fit into whatever conditions we're going to face when, when we're supposed to produce it. So, um, so uh, but it's been strange because, I mean, there's been extremely little travel. Um, that has also been, I realized that not going to an airport in over 100 days was a pretty awesome thing. <laughs> <laughs> and yet you were traveling a lot this year, didn't you? Well, well, I've been to. I was. We were in Sweden from mid March till beginning of July, so, and then we didn't even leave Stockholm. Uh, we barely left the 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 part of the city that we live in. Um, but then we then we made it our way back to America and was there for a couple of weeks. But but um, yeah, I've been. Since COVID started, I've done three trips, two to America and one to Turkey, and that's it. And I'm completely amateur in traveling now. I am I became one of those people I used to hate, you know, fiddling with phones, having water bottles in their carry-ons and, and, and dropping tickets and, and just being useless in security. I'm one of those people now. And... <laughs> <laughs> it's like it's, it's so a bit scary man because i haven't traveled by plane i don't know for a year already so kind of scares me what you're telling me now yeah yeah no i i became a complete amateur over it took three months and then i forgot all the tricks um and i actually apologized to airport security i was like i'm sorry i'm usually really good at this and i was like don't worry they we, we've seen a lot of worse <laughs> What's your favorite thing to hide or, you know, that's the funny story. Um, <laughs> well, um, actually, I'm really good with, I know exactly what you're allowed to put in your carry-on and what you're not. And I'm, I'm actually really, really good with that because I like my security check to be fast and flawless and, and not screw, screw it up for myself or for any, any, everyone else. But now when I showed up in July, I had a nail clipper. Um, now you shouldn't have that. Um, also a bottle of water, which is also not so good. Uh, 
and and I couldn't find my passport, which was like, <laughs> how do you how do you even do that? Do you know how technologically the Eurovision changed over time? You were there, uh, and the scale probably changed as well of all the technology. How can you can you describe this change? It's fascinating to me. Well, abs absolutely, and I mean. Now, I have to admit that I, I am, there is a lot of it to be blamed on me <laughs> because, because I was pushing it. Uh, my first Eurovision was Stockholm 2000. And that's when Eurovision went from being a moderate studio production into big, large-scale live event at the Stockholm Globe Arena. And that was... We, we, we just... The whole production team was just, we wanted to do something that had never been done and on a scale that had never been done. And we, we just wanted to bring Eurovision up to the level where we believed it belonged. So we introduced video technology. We had video panels on the stage. That was the first time. For, I mean, we were pioneers in it. And not, not only did we put them on stage, we put them on radio-controlled remote controlled wireless dollies so the led screens were moving around it, it was it was horrible <laughs> but 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 it finally worked and, and it turned out amazing and i think that ignited something within us um and every eurovision after that we with me pushing it, always been striving to do the new, the, the innovative, being on the front end of technology, embracing new technologies. Um, because it's, that's obviously the easiest way to surprise the audience and to give them a new, um, new thrill is to do something that has never been done before. And obviously using Equipment that has never been used before is the easiest way. Or using equipment in a brand new way. So, um, and Eurovision was actually pushing the whole development of the video industry back then. It was Eurovision uh, and then later lighting companies that was telling the, the video manufacturers with the production and LED what we wanted. Um, so it, it used to be driven by people doing conferences and trade shows and all of a sudden it was the world of Eurovision and lighting um, because we controlled these these LED screens with media servers that was controlled by lighting desks. We still do to this day. Um, so it turned into a lighting feature and a, an extremely creative instrument. Um, and, and that was all Eurovision doing that. Um, so, so, uh, and, and over the years there's been, we went from four by three to 16 by nine. We went from SD to HD. We went from stereo to 5.1. We went from seated audience to standing. Um, and, and, but what all Eurovisions have in common since 2000 is really pushing the boundaries of what can be done. Um, and it's the perfect it's the perfect format for it because Eurovision has one thing that no other shows have really, and that's a really long production rehearsal period. Um, and also, it has the 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 leverage of a, of a mega event, so you can and you can use that leverage against manufacturers and and call them like, hey, we're doing Eurovision. Uh, we want a light that doesn't exist, or we want a video projector that can do something that has never been done before, etc., etc., etc. So, so it's it's been oh, it's been an amazing joyride to um, to have been a part of. Yeah, is this the like setting up trends? Uh, just the Eurovision thing. I was in I was invited to to be in the other festival, and in two thousand, I think it was seventeen or 16, seventeen, I think. And I just see yeah. the scale, and after the, after this experience in person, I was w watching all the other shows the years after. Yeah. And yeah. for me, this this was kind of a 
point when I said I'm not sure what is bigger or even like technologically more advanced or is this for you some some kind of rehearsing thing or of technology or is this this drives you or helps you oh. or how 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 those two words uh, in influence each other? Well, I mean, there's there's um, uh, I mean, you can you can ask any creative person or tech geek um, how exciting it is to use something that has never been used before. Uh, then you can ask any production manager or head of production how risky it is <laughs> because sometimes things work really well on a plan and in real life not so well um, that has happened to us a couple of times uh, but in all those cases the length of the period the on-site production have saved us because there is time to fix things when uh, we, we got a pretty good lead time between loading in to we actually broadcast. Um, but I mean, there's a long, long row of technology that had a world debut on a Eurovision stage. Media servers, for one. Eurovision 2002 was the first show in the world using media servers. Um, Back in 2000, we played, we had a playback of the video content from the Obi truck, but now it was in the hands of the, of the lighting department. Yeah. Can also you, can you, can you, can, can you tell me on this? I understood exactly what you're talking about, but probably a lot of viewers, they just don't really know what media server is, uh, right. you know, because they right. can't see, they can't see it. They can't see it. It's something which helps to see yeah. our w visual things up yeah. in a, in a, in time so, and much faster yeah. and, and easier for everybody. Uh, yeah. Can you tell so, them the so, example where it really help? What yeah, you? well, a media server is basically a computer. Uh, and to that computer, you attach a bunch of hard drives with video content. The video content is produced by a content team. And it's done in very close cooperation with the delegations and the contest team. So we get a mood script from the delegations. This is something we request that they should submit to us um, during the head of delegation meeting, where we want them to describe either in words or with reference images, what is the look of the song and what is the feel? How, how, what does it look like when the song starts? How is the first verse, the uh, first chorus, the bridge and so on. And it's about, it's the mood, it's the colors, um, if there's any message, if they are underwater or in the mountains or in the forest, or if there's fire, uh, earth, wind. Well, they never ask for earth, really. It's the one element that, that all delegation seems to hate. No one wants, yeah, no one wants mud on their screens. I don't know. <laughs> but, but, so, and once we get this, information we sit down and we have a big creative meeting involving all the designers all the directors and and main core team of production and we actually decide who will get what because quite surprisingly you usually have three or four countries asking for fire and if we give them all fire one we're making two mistakes one we're creating a boring show two we are failing on giving each song uh, individual expression. Yeah, the unique one, the uniqueness. Yeah. yeah, yeah, because we have to, that is the main task, and that's also why Eurovision is so technology driven and the scale of the technology is so big. We have to have a toolbox where we can create four, up to 41, 42 absolute unique moments on stage. In addition to that, you have the openings and you have interval acts and you have all that fun stuff. But but the main reason why we have hundreds of trailers of gear is we need a really big toolbox for this to be able to do this because it's our job. It's it's in the end of the day we are there to make the artist and their song look and sound as good as ever possible. And, and the media server is loaded with the video content that is designed, and that is done based on the mood board, 
but also with, of course, a lot of inputs from the lighting director, because lighting and video has to match. We come to green frogs on the screen and then purple light. It makes no sense. Uh, we have to build a, a hole. Um, and when yeah, it sometimes it match... sometimes happens on the rehearsal. It doesn't still work, but that's absolutely oh, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, and that's why we rehearse so much because yeah. there's there's a lot of things going wrong. And I remember one time it was it was the funniest. It was in um, it was in Russia, two thousand nine, and Malta was doing their first rehearsal, and I believe it was Chiara singing for Malta at that time. And she was singing about stars and sky and this and that. And the video content team had completely ignored the script or the feedback from the Maltese delegation. So they had put her in an under, underwater environment with blue whales sw swimming by in the background. I mean, it, it was... It still, <laughs> it sounds was current. It it still sounds current Eurovision kind of thing, so it's okay. Yeah, it, but, but it had nothing to do with the with, uh, with song. And I remember the head, head of the delegation, Anton Atari, he looked at me, he's like, Ola, we're Malta, not fucking Atlantis. <laughs> How did that happen? It was... Um, the creative director for video content thought it was silly to have stars on the LED screens. It was too, you know, we've seen stars. Uh, uh, he didn't want to do stars. It was it was too normal. <laughs> but but he soon understood that okay maybe sometimes he doesn't have the final say in what's going to happen. Uh, but but. Yeah, and it was a fair remark because Iceland was singing in the stars and um, Estonia was surrounded by northern light. There was a lot of star theme already. Uh, but, you know, you, if you sing about stars, if, if, if the title of the song is stars, one would think that there should be stars somewhere in the song, not, not whales and, and jellyfish. If it's not the space whales or something, yeah, like yeah, exactly. Yeah, you never know that. That that's actually the funny thing I would like to 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 take to it. But we started to talking about it is how to is the preparation of staging the whole thing. You know, the head of delegation meeting. Yeah. How many data is just going on you on your mind that you have to listen understand and then say it's possible to be done because that's that's the thing for me yeah. as a former head of yeah. delegation to hear okay the idea is great but we can't do it or yeah. the idea is not great but we can do it you know yeah i mean we we spend an enormous time on that and and it's a big team involved in that because it's all about first of all we have the physical conditions um can you what is the maximum size of, for example, a prop? Uh, how long can it be? How wide can it be? How tall can it be? Uh, and maybe most important, how heavy can it be? Because it needs to go up a ramp. And, and, and mind you, we had over 50 people involved with a set change from one song to the next. Um, this year or last year in in tel aviv it was great because we didn't really have any physical limits um between the backstage and the stage so, which allowed that the props were taller than ever before including three ladies on six meter sticks oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> that's the theme of and, my all and, interviews the thing in every interview i've done since the first one this is the like fifth one uh Everybody was just there was always the reference for it. Probably it's the most yeah. remarkable things ever done at Eurovision, at some point of yeah. course. So that's, sorry, sorry, I just needed to say because it just make me it just make me laugh. Yeah, and I mean there is there is one even more remarkable besides us actually allowing Paul and and his team to put three girls on sticks. Um, then we also have a lovely contest producer, Christopher Bjorkman, who decided that Australia should be the second last in the final, followed by Spain. They came in with a whole fucking building. <laughs> and, and we still only have 40 seconds to do the changeover. Um, 
I I have it. I have a videotape of that changeover. It's it's pretty pretty historical, uh, and hysterical and very funny. It's it's it should have been done, but we did it. Um, but there was a robot but, on the stage as well, wasn't it? Yes. Oh yeah, I forgot him, but. I think he walked up himself, so so it, it was the house that was the problem there, um, and and getting the house on stage without killing the three girls on sticks that we rolled off on stage, uh, and and they were actually on the sticks when we rolled them down the ramp, uh, so, but but I mean we we always want to do the impossible. Um, and that's what I base my team on. That's that's how I handpick the team members because I need people that have has done. They have a track record doing the impossible. And Toba Barry is a great example there. The, the stage manager we had in in um, in uh, Tel Aviv. He 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 is the only person I know that could pull something like that off. And and the list of miracles he has performed on the Eurovision stage over the years, even in within the songs, uh, is there. There is a very funny moment with Demi in two thousand sixteen. She sit, yeah, she's sitting on a big glitter box, and I still to this day have not figured out what that glitter box had to do with any part of the performance. But anyway, she was sitting on it. And then we go to a big wide shot, and in the next shot, she's standing on stage, and the glitter box is magically disappeared. That was Tabe and his ninjas, uh, who came in and followed a steady cam. They were walking behind the steady cam, and when the steady comes back and do a reverse, there's him and three guys picking up the, the box and running for their life. So they're out of shot for the next shot which is after the big over over overhead shot was a front close frontal of of Demi so <laughs> and it was like a 25 meter run with this yeah box. and it kind of <laughs> sounds like it, it, it's against the rules to have so many people on the stage as well you know May well uh, yeah one 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 could argue that um but but I mean we the only thing we really don't allow is flying people. Um, we even though we've done that too, but in, officially we don't allow it because it's it's not safe. It's it's just to get the person up on stage, put him or her uh, in a harness, and do a fly segment. And we have like twenty seconds. Second. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, yeah. You, it's, it's not. Plus, also that you know you have wire cameras, you have overhead cameras, you have a couple of thousand moving lights and speakers. It, it's pretty crowded over the stage. So, um, but you know the holograms, all the holograms we did in twenty sixteen, which was really, really putting our neck out there. Um, to, yeah, a lot of, lot of. Uh, lot of strange things that we've done um and we haven't killed anyone <laughs> yet now hopefully that's not gonna happen yet. but I, I, this yeah that's this, the sense this, of humor i had I, to say sorry <laughs> this this is why i quit <laughs> <laughs> no you, you stop while you're ahead <laughs> no you, like, like you're gonna continue in america anyway so uh how Let's let's get back to technology and then we then we go to, to, mm -hmm. to the US thing. Uh, the last yep. year in Tel Aviv, you 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 shown the world like the big scale L AR technology which were used there. Yep. How satisfied are yep. you with this technology and would you use it again or or it's still not the time? No, absolutely. I would. I. I thought the way we used it in in Tel Aviv was extremely clever, and but you also learn because we we spoke about having AR on Eurovision already. Two thousand seventeen was the first time it came up, and uh, it was it didn't happen in twenty seventeen because the technology was not advanced enough. Um, 2018, we talked about it, but it really didn't fit the creative at all. 
Um, so 2019 was the year when it's like, okay, let's do it. And, and the first thing you learn with that is less is more. Don't overuse it. Um, if you do it, if you do subtle stunts with it, uh, that's enough to get the audience to go, how did they do that? And that's exactly what we what we're achieving. We want to we want to get the audience, and even industry industry professionals within our trade to go. How was that done? Um, but yeah, I now augmented reality is here to stay, um, but it should be. You have you have to be clever when you use it because. It's very easy that it overpower the whole performance, takes away the focus from the artist, and just turns into something really cheesy. Um, but if you do it in small portions here and there, um, it's people see it, but they can't really understand what was that. Um, and and uh, I think we did it very very well in in Tel Aviv. It was it was not overused. It was it was some points some parts where it was you know borderline. Okay, now it's getting too animated, but I think we got away with it. Yeah, how's the technology nowadays? Did it evolve kind of, or is just the limit of the AR in general? the The problem is that this technology is designed for studios, and we are in a live environment. Uh, we have plus 20 cameras um, and it the system can handle tracking five or six cameras in a good way um, so if you for example want to do a virtual set do the whole set with augmented reality well then you need to track all all your 20 cameras and then then you're going to need a computer that most probably doesn't exist yet <laughs> yeah, can't so it is on it's it yeah it's on the processing part plus that it's also it's you know we we put up 1000 markers in on the stage in tel aviv to track those five five uh, cameras so 1000 foil stickers that are this big that need to go up for the cameras to know where they were so and it feels like as long as you need that physical element to orientate in a 3d environment uh, we need to get past that speed bump um, because that will most probably also fasten up the processing of it if it's more virtual and i mean we're doing we're spending three weeks when when the lighting team comes to eurovision venue 85 percent of the show is already in the desks and it's done in a 3d virtual environment so why can't cameras do that i was like well still they still can't <laughs> i don't yeah and i mean uh, it's but i mean because we can program colors focus patterns everything with lights so um yeah they there is still some some work to be done there before it's it's going to be really useful for for us on the big on the big scale was it your bigger like the biggest struggle you know all the technology new new coming things or was there something like you you really remember okay that was the almost undoable or we couldn't do it for the reason the technology wasn't ready yet, or we just wanted it more and it just doesn't work. We, we thought it's gonna work differently. Yeah, well, there's many sides of that story. One of the, one of the, the things that we added to Eurovision that has created by far the most problem is the use of video, video screens and projection, because anyone can have opinion about that. And it has such a dominant effect of the whole of the whole um performance right, your experience yeah yeah and when we started with this that was i think that was one professional actually in 2002 
when we did Eurovision in Estonia and we had all these media servers and projectors with mirrors on it so we can move the image and, and, and project on the set that was moving. Um, we spend all the money on, on technology and realize that, oh, uh, we, we don't have any video content. <laughs> It turned out that it was a, a married couple that worked for the sports division at the Estonian Television. After they were done with their daytime job at TV House, they went home and sat and created all the digital content for Eurovision 2002 in their kitchen at home. And every morning on the way to Estonian Television, they came by the venue and dropped off a hard drive with new video content. <laughs> And the video content was done without any input from delegations because delegations couldn't relate to it. They, they, they didn't, it was like, what is this? It was like, well, we're we gonna show image, images, videos. Yeah, but we don't understand what, what you mean because it had never been done before. Mm -hmm. How hard it was to, to tell them, like there's a new technology, you know, when you know what they say AR, probably everybody will say, okay, so somehow, understand what is it but when the times when it didn't re like any technology like we know today didn't really exist in the scale or the countries yeah. slowly adopted adapted to it how how hard was it to tell them what you want it was it was very hard because to ma and to make it even harder the dialogue that we have with delegations today was not there back in those days that has excelled since 2010 um, because and, and it was a natural uh, development into that because year after year we had a lot of hiccups with video content um, we we <laughs> we gave we gave Cyprus red video content one year no 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 can't do red because it's Turkey right yeah, we had, I think it was Poland that asked for a shunted forest one year. And the, the team did this beautiful fairy tale forest with silk ribbons hanging off the trees. Now, guess what they do in Poland when a loved one dies? They hang silk, silk ribbons in the trees. So our... our I think it was Poland. I, I'm not going to take poison that. It could be Bulgaria. Um, yeah, but it's a lot of tricky, trickiness. Yeah, into yeah. It. And I mean, so in, we, we, we thought we had created the most amazing forest ever and we had built a graveyard. <laughs> yeah, but in different eyes. That's, that's, yeah, the, yeah. that's the diversity of the Europe. Isn't it nice? Yeah. Yeah, and, and I mean, that's we're there to embrace that. And, and so we have to be flexible enough to, when things go wrong, to quickly adapt and change it. But it could also be the other way. Um, 2016, the, um, the Romanian delegation had asked for rivers and forests and nature shots, mountains. Um, for their performance, and this was a very electric song, very with with Polly, a super cute, beautiful girl, great singer, really energetic performance. And when we heard the song and we saw the the wish, we're like, no. So we we gave her a very electric. Oh, it was the Polly Genova from Bulgaria, I think. Yeah. yeah. Oh, Bulgaria. Yeah. Yeah. We gave her a very electric performance and they were shocked. They were like, what, what have you done? And, and we we're like, well, we, we wanted to give this song a more modern expression. It, it's, it's. How was really the discussion worked? Yeah, I think most, I can, I can imagine it, of course, but lots of people, they just don't understand this creative environment at all. How does this yeah. work? Yeah, and I mean, that, that is always a problem to some extent because, um, and that's why we started with standing rehearsals that we recorded and sent out because you as a delegation, you, you, you have your song, you've chosen your song and 
in regardless of what environment that was done in, you have an image in your head of what your song should look like without knowing what what tools and toys and, and circumstances the Eurovision stage has. So, and if we don't manage to break that film in your head before you come to see your first onstage rehearsal, well, we have a huge pile of gravel to, to climb. Um, so, so that was why we started to send out the, the, the stand-ins. So as a delegation, the whole team could get a chance to understand what's going to happen when you travel to, in that case, was Melma was the first time we, we shared these. And we didn't know if we were creating a monster or not when we did that. It was, um, I, I was actually against it. Why? But Chris, because I was afraid that we would create a monster that we could never handle, that we would just get, because what, what you do is that you open up the door to viewing room a couple of weeks before it should be open. And there's only, with all these parameters to handle, Sure, we're organic and we're flexible, but there is there is a limit to what we can do. So I I was really, really nervous about it. Christer Bjorkman was pushing for it because and it was from his and that's why it's so been so great to work with Christer and as many Eurovisions as we've done together, because he has a fantastic creative eye, an artistic eye but it also has the background of being a head of delegation. So he can relate to both sides of it, which um, and I, I want to say that since Eurovision 2013, we have really increased the services to the delegations um, because it's, it's, that's the show. I see a dip, like, like as you said, as Christer, as I was making the staging as well as as I had a delegation being too. So being like all all of those chairs already, yep. and of course I can't, I, I don't want to do this comparison, but but just 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 to say out loud that this, like for me those kind of seeing rehearsals in advance to 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 be able to create and then be told or even in, in more advanced what, what can't be done because of the some yeah. kind of technological limits or yeah. or yeah. people yeah. limits or i don't know whatever limits whatever is not possible yeah. for me was great to know everything because for me it was then very easier to tell anybody else especially artists to tell what can be ha what can be done or what can't yeah. be done or how yeah. they or how your team think about what our idea was and did we send better material or did we send something wrong what, what, when those uh, thoughts just missed each other or or maybe yeah. it's your yeah. thought better and then we can discuss and that was for me for me this kind of thing is great as as well i yeah. can really understand how hard it must be for you that you opening kind of Pandora box and and yeah. always really kind of struggle and never know when it when it hit the wall and for me I can tell you what how was it for me in Czech Republic to to tell anyone that this is just a rehearsal it's not the final product yeah yeah it was super yeah. hard even for the people from the industry yeah like tell them like no just yeah. it's not the final thing that's that's the thing to discuss on that's the that's yeah. the base camp you know that's yeah yeah and that that and and that is that is quite funny because there's a there's actually several delegations that does, doesn't understand that we rehearse too. The rehearsal is not for you only; it's as much for us. Um, but the funniest remark, because it was so well received when we sent out the tapes in 2013. <laughs> I'm not going to say who said it, but there was one head of delegation. That's not the check because we weren't there. <laughs> No, it wasn't. It wasn't you. But one head of delegation said, "This is awesome. Your standings is much better than my my art is. So I can save six flight tickets here." Well, that can happen somewhere. But it's a good. Is, but, isn't, but, isn't, isn't a good thing to hear? Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, but but 
they showed up with their original artists, so, so our standings got off the hook, even though they were quite disappointed because they wanted to do it. Of course, we told them, it's like, hey, I think you outdid the original artist here. <laughs> yeah, well, never tell, never tell him or her, you can't say the name. No, no. But it, it is, the standings are a, an enormous help for everyone involved, both from delegation and from production. Um, it, it helps us a lot. What is the most common so, like, mistake from the delegations to tell you or not to tell you what they want to do? What is the common thing we all do, all did, or most of us do, and you just want to get rid of it? You you hate it. You Well, a lot of you complain about key light on the first rehearsal, um, that the follow spots are missing their target. And, uh, and yes, because this is the first time they see the performance. So of course they're going to miss. And this is why we rehearse. Uh, that's, that's the most common one. Uh, the second most common one is that you want a, a wide shot or a half wide shot directly after a Steadicam run, which will reveal the Steadicam operator. Um, and I think that is the two... Uh, oh, there's a third one. The the sound in the in the venue is not good, oh, yeah. which is also yes because it's empty right now. Yeah, um, and it's for television, so don't care about the, yeah, the yeah. venue at all. And and I mean, exactly. So so, but I mean, we we don't give up until all delegations are happy. That I mean, if. If we did, we wouldn't do. We wouldn't have done our job. So that's always our our um, our goal. And I would say most years we've reached that goal. There is always one or two that are really really hard, and you have to work, put in a lot of uh, love and care to it to polish it. So it's it's. Uh, but usually we succeed. Um, and, and I mean, that's one of the many challenges in this. It's like uh, the the songs is our show. The delegations are our clients. Uh, we are just a shop uh, that should provide. You know, up maybe the first Eurovision ever when I was told that, you know, everybody is kind of against us or there's a lot of politics into it or something like this. And I was kind of like wrapped into this a bit. After I realized that it's a whole... Like it's a bullshit. It's just you weren't oh, yeah. you weren't oh, prepared at all before, yeah. and now you're telling blah 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 all this kind of shit. I don't like it anymore. No. But then I no. saw how, and that's a big compliment. I would like to tell you and and the team, the whole people you were working with as well, that you really helped probably a lot of people like me, but probably a lot of other people from different countries. What it's really possible? How 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 the approach can be or should be towards the clients or I don't know if yeah. it can be artists yeah. that you're putting yeah. a helpful hand and I wouldn't say it, it was a shop I would say it was a workshop kind of a thing yeah. that you were yeah. teaching yeah. us all how, how those things can be done or how you struggle the problems can be done or how, how really uh, patiently you can tell us how, why it's not possible to be done even if this camera angle doesn't work really that well or you thought it's gonna work yeah. be better whatever but i loved that, that there was always a, a, a dialogue it wasn't uh we can't well, thank we, you yeah that was great that was great that really helped me a lot actually so i'm i'm very happy to to hear that because we of course we have to be patient because we sure we have a lot of pressure but you guys are there to represent a nation uh, with all the pressure that comes with that. I mean, your contestants, there's a lot at stake. And that is, of course, something we have to respect and embrace and, and, and handle. Um, and, you know, there's, there's sometimes there's loud voices involved. Well, it's... Yeah, I, I was know, one of them. Sometimes you... Okay. you, you yeah, sometimes you just have to let off steam. Um, and, you know, if your point is fair, we'll do everything we can to pursue that. If your point is wrong, we will tell you in the kindest way that we can um, and try to find a compromise or another solution. 
Um, but I mean, we're we're dealing with contestants here that are representing a country uh, in something as strange as music. <laughs> so I mean, yeah, where is and then you have thing, the, of course. See, yeah, so and you have the pressure from media, you have the pressure from your nation, there's the politics of it all. It's it's and those are some of the ingredients that makes Eurovision different to all other shows in the world. Um and that's also why it's been around for sixty five years. Yeah. How it will differ the Eurovision from the American one? Um quite a lot, uh but not so much. <laughs> You're yeah, starting to be a politic now, please tell me, tell me everything. <laughs> well, now the one thing that we, when we started with this project, we were like, yeah, well, you know, we take the Eurovision co- um, concept and apply it to America, um, which was a great idea. And then when you start thinking about it, you realize that, okay, there's actually only one country here. So we're kind of doing a melody festival and and not the Eurovision. But it's 50 states, isn't it? Uh, Correct. But they are still one country. Um, But, and then we realized that, well, we can't call the 50 governors and say, hey, we want a song and a performer uh, to represent you in in American Song Contest. Um, And and that was, I think, that was the earliest realization that we need to produce the qualifiers as well. Um, So the first part of the American Song Contest season is more like a melody festival. But instead of having one winner, there will be 20 or 24. Those will be broken down to two semifinals where half goes to the grand final. Um, so it's, it's, we're, we're hitting the Eurovision format in the end of the season with two semifinals and grand final. Can you zoom in a bit, uh, like the starting point? Like, if I understand it correctly, you'll just take, I don't know, 50 contestants or, or artists put them into brackets, kind of semi-finals, like we know those heats or how is it called in, in, in Melody Festival and then somebody will right, win and then right. you have like 24 people, 26, and put them into this classical like Eurovision process or, or how, how is it going to be? Yeah, it, it depends a little bit on what broadcaster we're going to end up with um, because there are a couple of different wishes uh, from the ones we're negotiating with, because we haven't finalized the broadcaster yet. That's uh, hopefully the big news of November, but uh, let's see. Um, but but we are in negotiation with, with several, uh, and they all have different wishes of how this should be done. Um, and we, so we, we actually developed a bunch of different formats. Um, the core format where we landed before we went into to pitches and later negotiations was that there would be five qualifier shows with 10, 10 states in each. So that would be five two-hour episodes uh, where uh, six songs were eliminated and four songs continued to to the semifinals. So after five episodes, you would have 20 songs and they were split 10 in first semi and 10 in second semi. And then from those semis, 50% will qualify to the grand final. So the grand final will also contestants be 10. Yeah. So it was a, a, a series of eight two hour shows. That, that was the format that we presented. So it's actually quite far from what Eurovision is, isn't it? It is, it is, absolutely. It, until you get... In, the first part of the season is much more similar to a Melody Festival. And, um, but then at some point we broke it down to 10 qualifiers with five states in each uh, because there was one broadcaster that wanted a longer season. So instead of five two-hour episodes, it was ten one-hour episodes. Um, 
and then going into the sep- the semi finals and final are still in all negotiations and all discussions remaining the same that that is the Eurovision format. What happens before that is there is there is many many ways of doing it, uh, and also what happens before that because you also have to have the the states to select the song to perform for them and there should be minimum three songs for them to choose from so that's 150 original songs that should be found and recorded and distributed somehow uh, and that could be there's a many ways of doing it it could be through the the local affiliates of a broadcaster could be done through through a media social platform could be from a, a music sharing platform could be through an app um that all depends on who we end up going to bed with but but time is ticking and we need to we need to move forward with this within very soon to to keep our to keep our mental health <laughs> because it's the, there there's a there's a lot of things that needs to happen between now and the fall of 2021 yeah it's quite it's all it's probably already should be should, should be known yeah i completely understand like how much time yeah. you like you already run up uh yeah but tell me you were but, talking but about also, you were, sorry but, but, you, but you also were, yeah. i would like to add when when we went into this our target was our main our primary target was 2021 late fall um there is nothing that says that that this will be spring 2022 or fall 2022 it it just has to evolve in a natural way and it will need to take the time that's needed because we can't we can't there we can rush it to some extent but but if we rush it too much we're gonna lack the story and the quality of the show mm-hmm. and and i mean there's or you or you're risking it, yeah. yeah and there is a there is a pretty big legacy that we're handling here so so uh which of course is extremely important to us yeah you were talking a lot about songs but uh, about the artist will each artist represent each state or or is it going yes. to be different no it's it's gonna be one song and one artist representing each state and with the same rules as on eurovision that it can be a a solo artist it can be a duo or it could be a band up to six members we will allow backing vocals on tape um and uh it has to be an original song that has not been published so that's that's more, that's identical set of rules. Yeah, that's what to... that's what actually even separates Eurovision or Eurovision format or melody festival and format or you know the national selection yeah, for, yeah, format yeah. in general I mean that... from any other talent yeah. show in the world, yeah, which are exactly. karaoke. Yeah, yeah, and that's also something we've been pushing so much in all talks. This is not a talent show; it's a competition. And and that also puts a whole another range of of uh, of demands on the performer, because on Idol or X Factor, anyone can go up and sing a, a cover and get away with it. Now look at all those Idol and X Factor winners. Where are their big multi multi million dollar record deals? They don't have them because they're just know, some of them have, yeah. Some of them has been ex- successful to some extent. Uh, Kelly Clarkson is a great example. She she managed to do a career, but she ma- didn't manage to sustain it. She's a television host today. I don't I don't know. It, 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 I I I don't have the the information on when she released a, a new record, but I would say it was a couple of years ago at least, and. There's there's an X, fa- X factor needed to for a performer to carry an unheard song and to sell it to an audience on camera. That's not for everyone. That's and and 
and we see that every year in Eurovision as well, how important it is to communicate your message to the camera. If you do that well, you're going to do well in the, in the ratings. Um, if you don't, it really doesn't matter how great of a song you have. Um, it doesn't click. When it doesn't you, click, it doesn't work. No, exactly. You have to connect with the audience. You, you just have to do that. And your audience is the TV, TV audience primarily uh, because they, that's 200 million people. Like we, we'll see, we see in, in Eurovision world that, that there is a trend from like lots of countries to, to, to have an artist or to, 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 to take an artist or to represent them which or who is just the winner or the second to win of the X Factor or or whatever similar format it is yeah. of the talent show and they then they give him a, or her or the band whatever they give them a a song and they just try to you know make it happen and most of the time I think it doesn't really work or I don't think it's the good way but that's 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 how I look at it but how can you do it in America when this tradition is different. How 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 will you find those artists to to really perform will, their songs, or or will you just do the combination? Yeah. How how this how this will work? We we will we will uh, one is not necessarily attached to the other. Um, in and there's a good there's a good uh, example the way Swedish television does it. They. Songwriters from from all over the world are submitting songs to to the Melody Festival, and and then there is a, a listening group that listens through all these songs and then finally choose the twenty eight songs that should be in Melody Festival. And some of those songs comes with an artist. Some of those songs are paired with an artist. Some of those songs, the artists are changed. Um, Euphoria was originally recorded and presented to, to Swedish television with Danny Susido singing it. And then they put Lorene in. I think it was Danny. It was someone else. Uh, but, but it was like... And, there's, and guess what? Lorene came from Idol. Oh, yeah. That's what I'm asking. Yeah. Like, maybe that doesn't really matter... No, I you... think it's more it's more finding the the electricity between the song and the artist. Um, we will uh, just as in Sweden, we will work with all the major record labels in America to find the artists, also to find the songs, um, and because all record labels have a stash of performers on the back burner that they are waiting for a great platform to launch them on. We want to be that platform. We also want to be the platform for if, if Cher decides to record a new album, she should be on our stage. If Britney Spears decides to, to start singing heavy metal, if, if you know, we, we want to be a, we will never have Justin Timberlake on stage uh, as a contestants, maybe as an interval act, who knows? Um, but, or most likely not. Uh, and that's not what the show is for. It's for about to be and has been. <laughs> is it More. planned to be like the bigger the, or the biggest thing? and entertainment in America as well as Eurovision Song Contest is, is, is the biggest entertainment format in, in, in Europe at one point. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. Um, and, uh, and adding to what I said before, yes, of course, it should also be to find the diamonds in the rough. But, but, but it's like we're, we're focusing on uh, established but not... Established artists that are known, that are not known to the masses, um, because we know that they, they can carry a song, just by, by being a professional artist, um, and then yeah, I mean it's it's, just like Eurovision, this American Song Contest is going to be for everyone, 
but but um, it's it's not a talent show. No. It's, Was the movie part of a plan to to introduce the Eurovision brands to US, or it's just a common coincidence? Or it's it's actually a common coincidence. Um, we. Um, I met Will and the Netflix team already 2018 in uh, in Portugal and I had the pleasure to spend quite a lot of time with him. Um, and it was so funny last year when they showed up in Tel Aviv. Um, we Because one of the things we talked about 2018 was that he says, like, it's so crazy that this show is not in America. So when I met him uh, backstage 2019, I said, hey, Will, Listen, uh, guess what? We're bringing this to America. The first thing that came out of his mouth was, can I host it? <laughs> that makes sense. Uh, but, and and, um, and I, I thought, I, I liked the movie. Uh, I thought it was a very warm tribute to the format of Eurovision. I, I think it was done with a lot of love, humor and grace. I, uh, and... Um, and the medley part is just it's it's already movie history it's it's um it's not the best will ferrell movie i've ever seen um but it's i can't say that it did did, did any damage to us or or to eurovision on the contrary it's it brought uh to the attention of americans on a much wider range than before um and but it was a lucky coincidence it it really was and um uh, so thank you will and thank you netflix <laughs> uh, i'm not sure he's gonna he's gonna see this but we'll you never know uh you never know yeah you never know if, if you do call me <laughs> Can you can you tell me Ola the the American Song Contest is a competition for Eurovision Song Contest and does Eurovision com, con, Song Contest or the countries involved in it needs this competition to see how US doing it? Well, we we are we are in a very actually uh, EBU is very involved with us in this. Uh, everything we do, uh, we discuss with EBU and any, you know, the slightest change of format that needs to be done in the adaption has to be sanctioned by EBU. It's, it's, they are, uh, and I mean, we have the license agreement with them and, and so we are very deep in bed with EBU. How, and of course we, we want we want the feed from our broadcast to be available over the EBU network in in Europe. We want to have interaction with Eurovision um, because this this is much more a celebration of Eurovision than anything else. It's we're taking the strongest TV format in the world to a new brand new market, um, and of course we want. Europe to access this um, and it could also be uh, you know content wise there is nothing that says that the winner of Eurovision is not an interval act on American Song Contest or vice versa we will most probably never send a contestant to the Eurovision Song Contest um, but but we would like to have our winner uh, being represented and there's there's many ways that we can mix and match mm -hmm. this um and so my because point, it, my, you know my, is... my, sorry to interrupt you but my point my point was that that's my my personal opinion and you maybe don't need to answer anyway but i see that a lot of countries really approach eurovision as a eurovision thing not something pushing the limits forward but maybe just to go two steps backwards what worked what worked you know cliches and whatever and probably us even under your command and your team uh, you're probably and that's what i thought but maybe you'll tell me different just want to go even further different way not to be super 
super same Eurovision, but maybe show that it can be done like even like wow way, American way or different way, something you you probably struggle to introduce in Europe maybe. Is that mm. that's what I that what I that was my thought about the competition yeah. to Eurovision. Yeah. Well, I think that we will have you will see a much bigger diversity of music in American Song Contest because you have all these genres in America that are not present in, in Europe to that extent. You have bluegrass, you have jazz, you have blues, you have rock and roll, you have hip hop, R and B, Motown, you have you have all these and they're really you can almost point to a house and say, This is where rap was invented. This is where all the Motown well actually you can point at the studio where all the Motown records were recorded. <laughs> um and so you have a a musical diversity that is much bigger in America and with much deeper roots to its origin. Um Having that said, one of our biggest fears is that we end up with 50 country songs. <laughs> uh, because that's that's like the Euro, Euro disco of America, if you like. Um, but one thing that is an, for the TV show and the story we're telling, an enormous benefit for us is that we will produce all the songs from scratch the first couple of years because it's it's an educational process that we have to educate the states of what we need and what we want and 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 then we see that what 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 we're looking for uh, we need to educate the, the states in what this is and what we are in in the future expecting from them And I think that the big music states like California, New York, and Texas, and, and uh, Tennessee would most probably take control over their own uh, contest song very fast. Within within the first three years, there would be, hey, there will be a call from California. Hey, don't worry about us. We got the song. Is this, your, is this what uh, you're aiming for? Because I love this. Absolutely. I mean. Ab absolutely. Um, we we want this to be uh, a thing on the network for the, the affiliates to a bigger broadcaster or if it's on a country fair or if it's, you know, there's, there's every state has at least one event a year where they could add this to, to because it's, we're doing this show for Heartland America. Um, So Heartland America needs to be involved. Uh, we're not doing this for LA or New York or Chicago. We're doing it for, for the Heartland. This, that's, where, that's where the passion lays in this. Uh, people in LA are most probably too busy and snobby to, to even cast a vote for anything anyway. Um, so so this, this so is the main spirit of Eurovision to connect, connect people in one event continues in American Song Contest, isn't it? Exactly, exactly. To unite them on, around something because they, they tend to have an argument about most things right now. And and it's, you know, if you look at, it's, it's the same core reasons why Eurovision was created to start with, was to unite a continent after the Second World War. So, Again, it's it's a complete coincidence, but the timing is pretty good. Yeah. So the signs are there. <laughs> the signs are there, man. Yeah. <laughs> And I'm like the biggest fan of this contest. You know, I, I think we all need to see how how different it can be done, or how this format it really is huge. And maybe in ten years we'll 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 see the, you know, you know even the bigger competition, which I wouldn't mind to see. Uh, I would like. Yeah. I would love to yeah. see it even more diverse. There may be diff different things, or maybe even different bigger formats. I mean, and and the thing is, like, if we manage to crack the code for a new market, well, then then 
all the other markets, you can most probably apply that code to Asian market and African market, and, and all of a sudden we have a world, world Vision Song Contest. That would be pretty cool. Um, and, and, um, but we decided to start with America. <laughs> yeah, that is understandable, I think, and I hope that, that it really, really, really gonna happen in a short time and you will know when, when it happened and you'll tell us yeah, in advance as well. Yeah, I, I really believe oh, that yeah. you need to, need, need to know it really, really soon. Yeah, and, uh, but we we are without saying too much. We are close to to sign a deal and move on. So fingers crossed. Yeah, man, uh, really, really a huge fingers crossed for you. And there's one more questions I just need to ask. You always with your like Christer and this team, they're called Swedish mafia, and I just I just love it. So how this you know after Italian mafia and Chinese mafia. <laughs> Is this the time of Swedish Mafia just rocks the house in the US? And where's it gonna be your headquarters? Yes. Uh, LA. Uh, the, the Swedish uh, Eurovision Mafia is invading LA with all of its uh, glamour. <laughs> <laughs> and fun. <laughs> and knowledge. Man, thank you very much for this interview. It was a pleasure and great fun and I learned so much. So uh, thank you very much. Likewise. Well, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.